compliment. Um, uh, and we'll have an ESI uh, speaker of the day who I'll introduce briefly, followed by um, a spotlight on, on uh, some early stage investigators in our community uh, who are doing um, research on uh, comorbidities in HIV. Um, uh, so Katerina Bayanova and Matt Dursenfeld. Um, uh, but uh, uh, to kick things off, uh, we I'm delighted to introduce uh, Rebecca Abelman, uh, who is a third year ID fellow here at UCSF. And we were lucky enough to steal her away from Harvard um, uh, where she had uh, initially developed her interest in sex differences in HIV with a particular focus on comorbidities. Um, uh, she's uh, particularly interested in the, uh, the role sex plays in modifying the risk of cardiopulmonary uh, complications um, uh, in people with HIV. And um, uh, she's uh, currently co-mentored uh, by both uh, Lawrence Wong, uh, who's here in uh, Phyllis Tien. Um, uh, with Lawrence, uh, she's doing a lot of work uh, in Uganda uh, looking at the uh, uh, pulmonary complications of uh, TB. And with Phyllis, uh, here she's working with a Max and Wise uh, cohorts, uh, also looking at sex differences. And so uh, we're delighted to have her uh, uh, here to give the ESI talk of the day. And then when she's done, she'll be uh, introducing Eileen. So Rebecca, uh, please welcome. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Peter. And I'm very excited to be the ESI of the day today. And because of your introduction, I don't need to spend too much time going through this, but uh, as Peter mentioned, I'm a third year infectious disease fellow, and I'm transitioning to a K-12 award in July. My mentors are Dr. Huang and Dr. Tian, and my research interest is in the progression of aging-related comorbidities in women with HIV across the reproductive lifespan. So first, I'm going to touch briefly on the challenges in categorizing menopause in women with HIV, and then I'm going to use that as a jumping off point to discuss a paper that we just published in CID. So for those of you who haven't thought about menopause in a while, what is the menopausal transition? So menopause represents the permanent cessation of menses due to complete depletion of ovarian follicles. And the menopausal transition is the multi-year period characterized by declines in ovarian reserve. The current gold standard for categorizing menopause in the general population is using the Stages of Reproductive Aging Workshop, or STRAW criteria, and it divides women into reproductive stages, uh, such as premenopause, perimenopause, and postmenopause, and it relies primarily on self-report of menstrual status, as well as the final menstrual period, or the FMP. And women with HIV are more likely to have periods of amenorrhea due to chronic illness, and so that makes self-report potentially unreliable in this population. There are several clinical uh, important um, things to considerations uh, for the transition to menopause. So we know that menopause accelerates the onset and progression of many chronic diseases in the general population, including increases in body composition, decreased bone mineral density, neurocognitive changes, and then there's also some evidence to suggest that it's associated with decreased pulmonary function. And women with HIV are particularly vulnerable to the changes during the menopausal transition as they may experience menopause at earlier ages. And then there's been some studies coming out of the Max and Weiss cohort that has found that menopausal women with HIV have had higher immune activation biomarkers, including SCD14 and SCD163, than their premenopausal counterparts. One of the challenges in categorizing menopause in women with HIV and in the general population also has to do with hormonal fluctuations. So here are, is a graph of the hormonal fluctuations that happen during the reproductive phase. So during the reproductive phase, menstruation occurs in response to interactions of hormones that are produced by the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the ovaries. And then during the menopausal transition, so the uh, graph on the left at the bottom is what happens during menopause. Hormonal fluctuations during menopause occur due to declines in ovarian reserve, and that leads to compensatory changes in ovarian and pituitary hormone production. So I want to bring your attention to the orange line, which is antimalarian hormone. And as you can see here, uh, during the reproductive phase, antimalarian hormone levels are constant during the menstrual cycle, and then they reliably decrease over the menopausal transition. So that make, makes it an interesting and intriguing biomarker when thinking about determining menopausal phase. So a little bit more about antimalarian hormone, or AMH. So it's a measure of the ovarian follicle that is stable across the ovulatory cycle, and it's a biomarker of ovarian age and gonadal age, and it's been used in the general population to determine menstrual phase, menopausal phase. So there's been some studies, um, mostly coming out of the Women's Interagency HIV Study, or the WISE, that have found that antimalarian hormone has demonstrated good agreement with ovarian reserve among women with HIV with regular menstrual cycles, 
and has also been a strong predictor of the age at FMP among women with HIV. So with that, I'd like to segue into some work that we just published in CID titled Body Composition Changes Over the Menopausal Transition Among Women with and Without HIV. The objective of this study was to examine the influence of menopausal phase on the trajectory of body mass index and waist circumference among women with and without HIV in the Ys. And we hypothesized that women with HIV would have different BMI and waist circumference trajectories than women without HIV, and that HIV-associated factors would influence body composition changes. The methods of the study, so this was conducted within the WISE, which is now part of the MAX-WISE Combined Cohort Study, or MWCCS, which is a multi-center prospective cohort study across 10 US sites. And it enrolls women with HIV, as well as demographically similar women without HIV, but with similar HIV risk factors. And as part of the WISE, women have study visits every six months, and they get BMI, waist circumference measurements, in addition to biospecimen collection and survey administration. So for this study, we used antimalarian hormone to determine menopausal status. And the inclusion criteria was that women had to have at least one detectable AMH before their first undetectable AMH between the years 2000 and 2014. The reason we picked 2000 is that we wanted to mitigate any kind of potential effects from older antiretroviral regimens that have been associated with body composition changes. Uh, and the participants needed to have available repeated measures of BMI and waist circumference. Up. Uh, measures after their first undetectable AMH, and that was through 2017 when we had our most recent measures of antimalarian hormone. These are the results at the first undetectable AMH visit. And as you can see here, I just want to highlight that the age of undetectable AMH was similar between the HIV positive and HIV negative groups and was uh, 46. And then as you can see, the undetectable HIV viral load was at 58%. And I think those are the most important things to highlight for now, given the time restraints. So this is a, a graph of some of the results. So this is the relationship of chronologic aging and undetectable AMH by HIV status. So on the left is the BMI. And what we did is we looked at women who had early um, undetectable AMH and late undetectable AMH. So that's the solid and dotted line respectively. And then we were looking at women with HIV. Um, so that's the red line and women without HIV, that's the blue line. And what I wanna highlight on the left is that as you can see that women with HIV, BMI remained mostly flat. Whereas women without HIV, BMI increased slowly until about 50 and then slowly started to decline. On the right, we have uh, waist circumference. And as you can see, women with and without HIV had progressive increases of waist circumference over time, but that beginning at perimenopause uh, around age 50, the increase is steeper among women with HIV. So here is a, uh, just a table that's showing these results in a table form and numerical form. And what we did is we were looking at um, rates of change. So this is looking at the percent increase. Uh, so if you look at, for example, an early perimenopause what, and with premenopause as the reference, um, the, that number is indicating that we estimated the percent increase in BMI per year was lower by 0.55 during early perimenopause than it would be at the same age if the woman were still in the premenopause phase. What I want to highlight is that women with HIV as, with BMI had uh, trajectories that were mostly in the negative direction, whereas women without HIV, the trajectories were primarily in the positive direction, although they didn't reach statistical significance. And then when looking at waist circumference here, you can see similar trends. So women with HIV had uh, trends that were mostly in the negative direction, whereas women with HIV had mostly in the positive direction, although these did not reach statistical significance. Corroborating these results, we found that HIV-associated factors influence BMI and waist circumference trajectory. So we saw that among women with HIV, detectable HIV um, RNA was associated with rates of change in a negative direction for both BMI and waist circumference. And we saw that ART use was uh, associated with BMI change in a positive direction. Interestingly, so we performed a sensitivity analysis among women with HIV and afavirenz, and this was to mitigate potentially any kind of confounding as afavirenz has poten potentially has weight effects. And we found that the rates of change uh, remained in the negative direction corroborating these results. So in summary, in women with HIV, the menopausal transition was associated with annual rates of change in BMI that were lower when compared to premenopause after adjustment for chronologic age. And findings were in the same direction for waist circumference, but were smaller and not statistically significant. And women without HIV, being in late and early perimenopause was associated with annual rates of change of BMI and waist circumference 
changed that were non-statistically significantly higher when compared to premenopause after adjustment for chronologic age. So in conclusion, this suggests that the expected increases in weight gain during the menopausal transition are blunted by HIV infection and begs the question of if there's a possible contribution of early ART on subcutaneous adipose tissue. In terms of future directions, we're gonna evaluate this further by looking at body composition change during the transition to menopause with exposure to newer antiretroviral regimens such as integrase strand transfer inhibitors. And with that, I'd like to conclude and just thank all my amazing collaborators and teams, and of course our patients and Dr. Scully. Thanks, Rebecca. That was terrific. Um, and we'll open it up uh, to questions uh, now. Um, Sugi? Oh, and uh, maybe we can pass a microphone. <clears throat> and, um, okay. That was a great talk, Rebecca. Thank you so much. Um, I had a couple of questions. So mm -hmm. one, I might have missed this in the beginning. Did you... Um, you talked about it on your summary slide, but did you adjust for duration of ART suppression? You know, you're looking at, you know, something over time, but I was kind of curious sort of thinking back how long these folks had been on therapy. Are you picking up an artifact of how long they've been suppressed? Um, and also obviously timing of ART, which may or not may mm -hmm. not be present in your data set. And then the second thing I was going to say is um, I got an email like last week with that data on I think it was dolutegravir with weight gain um, and wondered if you had any comments on that. Yeah, great questions. So for your first question, I didn't have the time to really talk about the statistical analysis, but we were doing, we were looking at um, both menopausal phase. We, were, we ended up doing similar to repeated measures. So we were looking at over time, um, whether or not participants were on ART as well as viral load, and we were adjusting for that across different menopausal phases. So we did incorporate that into our analysis. However, we didn't include time on ART as one of our variables, but we tried to um, account for differences in viral suppression. So viral suppression rates, because of the time that this study was taking place, there are very large differences in viral suppression rates at the beginning versus the end of the study because of the introduction of a lot of these newer antiretroviral regimens. So we tried to take that into account with our analytical plan. Um, for your second question, that is exactly what we're hoping to do now. So our next study is looking at dolutegravir and um, bictegravir and these newer integrase inhibitors, as well as TAF, and whether this actually changes our results, because we hypothesize, given the time that we were looking at um, women, so from 2000 to 2014, there were probably some residual effects from earlier antiretroviral therapies that were contributing to our results. So that's what we really want to look into now. So I have a quick question, and then Aisha Appa online also has a, a quick question, which I'll, uh, I'll say. So uh, my question is that um, uh, Dr. Scully was involved in some uh, research uh, showing that during the menopausal transition, the loss of estrogen actually um, uh, uh, causes increased HIV expression uh, from cells, um, sort of like a latency reversal um, uh, type phenomenon. And I'm wondering whether that increased um, HIV exposure and, and the consequent inflammation might be contributing to some of the weight, you know, uh, the lack of weight gain that you're seeing. Yeah, I have, I have a very similar theory. And I think that's also why we saw, at least in this WISE study, it was using final menstrual period or FMP to determine menopausal phase, not antimalarian hormone, but did find that uh, biomarkers were elevated um, post-menopause compared to premenopause. Uh, we're going to be looking at that as well. So we're going to be looking at biomarkers and using antimalarian hormone to determine menopausal phase to look at uh, biomarker levels as well. Awesome. Uh, and then uh, Aisha Appa online uh, has a, a question about uh, uh, stimulant and methamphetamine use and whether that was measured in this study and did it contribute to any of the weight changes? Yeah, that's a great question, Aisha. Thanks for it. Uh, so we unfortunately did not include stimulant use, and that is a really important question. We did include substance use, so we include smoking and, and alcohol use, um, but we that's an area that we should certainly start to collect in our participants. Okay, with that, we'll transition into the next uh, uh, segment. And so would you like to yeah, introduce so, our guest speaker? Yes, so I get to introduce Dr. Scully today. So I'm thrilled to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Eileen Scully. She's an associate professor of medicine at Johns Hopkins. And in addition to running a research lab on HIV immunopathogenesis, she's an active member of the ACTG's Cure Transformative Science Group, the Women's Health Collaborative Science Group, and serves on the Inter-CFAR HIV and Women Executive Committee. 
Clinically, she takes care of patients with HIV, and she's here today to discuss sex differences in SARS-CoV-2 disease severity and pathogenesis. So Dr. Scully earned her MD and PhD in immunobiology from the Yale School of Medicine. After completing her residency at Brigham and Women's Hospital, she continued her training in infectious diseases at the Harvard Combined Program. While at Harvard, she did both in-depth HIV training as an HIV fellow, as well as a postdoctoral uh, fellowship at the Ragon. Since joining faculty at Hopkins, she's made major contributions to the understanding of how biologic sex contributes to HIV and COVID pathogenesis. Um, so she'll be sharing some of that work with us today. So please welcome me and join, join me in welcoming Dr. Scully. Great. Well, thank you so much. And thank you, Rebecca, for that great talk. I have lots of questions and thoughts, but I'll save them for when we get to talk a little bit later today. Um, and thanks everyone for for having me here today. So I'll shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, hopefully some people will also find that other pandemic still interesting. So just to dive right in, I think this slide was one that I made on March 10th under the um, careful shepherding of, of Dr. Peter Hunt, who was helping me to prepare a talk about sex differences in HIV for Croy. But at that time, the pandemic was just emerging and Peter said, oh, there's this article in the New York Times about how it's different by sex. And so at that time, there was a report of greater mortality among males with SARS-CoV-2, but it was like immediately attributed to like, but more of them smoke. And so this comes into this whole sex and gender uh, sort of dichotomy, which is not really a dichotomy, but rather a combination of multiple different forces that we have to continuously parse if we're going to actually develop therapeutics that are better targeted. But this is the slide that I was able to develop in 2020, which is that in the first two coronavirus epidemic SARS-1 and MERS, there were higher mortality in males. For MERS, there was an association with dromedary exposure, so probably more of a gender-based effect in the number of cases at least, and then harder to parse out whether there was a difference in outcome once infected. But there was also this mouse model of coronavirus infection that showed prolonged female mouse survival after infection with SARS-CoV-1, and that blocking estradiol actually eliminated the female protective effect. And this is from a, a JI paper in 2017. So at that time, both, this, both evidence for gender and sex in coronavirus infections in the past. So I worked with Sabra Klein and, and a few colleagues to look at early data emerging. This paper came out in June and, and included data as of May of 2020. And this looked at the average case fatality rate of reported coronavirus infections using data from the global 50-50 tracker, which reported in, and across these 37 countries, there was an average case fatality rate of 1.7 higher among males compared to females. Multiple other epidemiologic studies, including the UK Open Safely study of 17 million people receiving care through the UK medical system, show a relative risk of a uh, hazard ratio here of deaths for males that's on the order of you know, organ transplant or having um, di uncontrolled diabetes or obesity in the range of 35 to 39 that's associated with male sex. And so the unadjusted was 1.78, nearly exactly the same as our case fatality estimate. And the fully adjusted was 1.59 for males to have worse outcomes. Likewise, in data from France early in that uh, pandemic, there were higher probabilities of hospitalization, ICU admission and death among males. This was a paper published in Science in 2020. So now with this as a background, we immediately have to turn back to why. So gender-based factors certainly can have a major impact and that can be in risk-taking behaviors. Although you know, 80% of healthcare workers globally are female when you include nursing, home health aid, care providers, all the way up to physicians, it's you know, a lot over-representation of females. So that wouldn't necessarily lead to lower risk of exposure as in a dromedary exposure type of case, but maybe there's better acceptance of masking or other non-pharmacologic um, non preventive measures. So how do you parse these things? But at the time, I also felt like there was really a strong biological basis to hypothesize numerous differences at which biological sex, by which I mean your, your sex chromosome complement, your epigenetic architecture, and or the prevalent differences in just immune responses that are associated with being XY and having uh, testosterone versus XX and having uh, estrogen exposure. And these include a variety of immunologic things, like for example, TLR7, X chromosome linked expression, biallelic expression in females. And that has borne out just in the, the case report of the rare cases of TLR7 deficient males who had severe disease, risk of autoantibodies and um, 
anti-interferon autoantibody syndromes, which in the Casanova papers show a marked sex difference as well. And then also ACE2 and X-linked gene, which also has the potential to show some genetic architectural differences. So with these things as a background, um, I think I'll just take one moment to say like what happened as the pandemic progressed. So this is very early data. So this is the most up-to-date global 50-50, which they stopped doing it in October of, of 2022. But if you take every 10 female cases, so for every 10 female tests, there are eight male tests done. So males are testing a little bit lower. For every 10 female tests, there are, um, for, every, for each of the same 10 tests, there are 10 male cases, so exactly the same. For every 10 female hospitalizations, there are 12 male hospitalizations. For every 10 female ICU admissions, 17 male ICU admissions. And for every 10 female deaths, there are 13 male deaths. So still showing this consistent risk, higher risk of severity, maybe with some improvement in our treatment interventions over time, but this is like very large data sets across, I think they have 120 countries reporting for some of these outcomes. And when the numbers are that consistent across multiple different contexts, you have to argue that there's maybe a gender effect, but also a sex effect as gender will vary also by social construct. So sex versus gender, just to comment briefly again on this, there was a paper in, in Nature early in the pandemic also that cited a few differences in immunologic cell profiles as being difference between females and males. We can discuss for a while whether or not that paper is perfect, but it did suggest that there are some differences. And then there was this sort of takedown paper published thereafter that suggested that basically all these things were roughly similar. So I would say that um, in response to the authors of the second paper that in most of our quotes blockbuster immunologic papers, most of the, the things are similar. The differences that we observe between populations are subtle. And it's when they emerge consistently, when there's a biological plausibility and when they emerge across different repetitions and subsets, that's when we pay attention to them. So the fact that the differences were not huge was not overwhelmingly convincing to me, but I'll also say this just felt like sort of like, you know, girl on girl violence in terms of like both sex and gender are important. And if we start arguing that one is important and the other is not, I think we all lose in terms of really understanding the biology and how to um, help all patients, every patient who sits in front of you, whether they're cisgender, transgender of either um, orientation, then we can't answer these questions if we start to dig our heels in on it being one or the other. Okay, so let's get into a little bit of, of data now from what we were able to generate. So we approached this question of how can we think about sex and gender in SARS-CoV-2 pathogenesis, and we started with our own data. So this is our Crown Registry. This is already um, published, but more than 200,000 patients, uh, individuals who presented for testing, and only individuals had no prior negative test. So on the left, we see the left, yes, the test positive rate, which is higher overall for males between the ages of 18 and 74. They were also testing at a lower frequency, suggesting a gender effect in who seeks testing. And then if you take those who tested positive, again, between the ages of 18 and 74, we see a higher rate of hospital requiring hospital admission among the males who were tested. When we look at, so then now we can think across the spectrum. So is it that Females are having asymptomatic disease and they're presenting more frequently for testing. So it looks like they're doing better, but really we're just identifying more asymptomatic cases. Or is it that females get infected at the same rate? They're just more likely to be asymptomatic. So thinking across the spectrum of where a difference might emerge. We looked at our asymptomatic testing data. So this is 102,000 different asymptomatic tests. And overall in total, there was really no difference in rate of test positivity between males and females who are asymptomatic. At admission for other reasons for hospitalization, slightly higher in males, but all the other ones are, are similar, although no males presented to labor and delivery. Um, we did also across this data look at how rates of, of test positivity among different ethnic uh, groups in our community, and we saw this really tight overlay of, of test positivity suggesting that we were detecting like within community transmission and, and the kinds of population dynamics that we would expect to see. So from this data, we can conclude that women test slightly more men have a higher test positivity rate, but they're testing less, and that of those who test positive, more men were hospitalized in this large overall data set. Then we look specifically at the 2,626 individuals admitted to the five Hopkins affiliated hospitals with COVID-19 between March and October, so pre-vaccine. And you can see here, there's like 1,280 females and 1,300 males. And overall, some minor differences in race and ethnicity background, a slight difference in time to severe death or outcome. Again, a gender-based potential. Men wait until they're super sick before presenting would be a, a reason for them to do worse on admission. We saw a slight difference, but it was about four hours of difference. And 
we're just not that good as physicians to make for me to think that a four hour difference was leading to a difference in outcomes. So we looked at a number of other factors. So COPD and asthma is more frequent in females, hypertension and CKD more frequent in males, more smoking and alcohol use in males and more obesity in females. And that's the one I've, I've depicted here. So BMI greater than 40 here is captured by that large red bar or the, the red bar, not always large and all age groups summarized on the right. And then each of the individual. And, you know, we do know that obesity is associated with an increased risk of severe outcomes. And yet it is enriched among females in the United States, which is consistent with population data. And I think also consistent with loads of data to suggest that obesity is not obesity in in every different situation and in, and that there may be important influences of sex, gender, or hormone exposure on how obesity impacts your inflammatory response and also your overall health. Um, so just a, a plug for the kind of work that Rebecca and others are, are doing. Um, so then we looked at inflammatory labs. So these are all clinical measures. So not a laboratory based measure done within 48 hours of hospital presentation. And we selected labs that were proposed at the time to have a, a predictive power in SARS-CoV-2 infection. And going from left to right there by age group underneath the ends for, cause we didn't have this, these tests for every, every individual. For example, IL-6 was only available in about 900 of the 970 of the individuals of the 2,600. But what you can see is that for some of them, there's a consistent shift in difference. So the little black line connects the median. So you can sort of see the slope of change as you move through age strata. And for example, IL-6 and ferritin, there's a much larger difference between the males in red and uh, the females in red and the males in blue at the youngest age stratum than sort of flattens out over time. In contrast, the absolute lymphocyte count is fairly consistent in the, the slope over time, as is the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. And the D-dimer, which I thought was gonna be different, was actually shows no real consistent relationship and overall in sum is actually equivalent between the two time points. So, Next, we decided to do a logistic regression model to estimate the age-specific odds ratio of a severe or death outcome defined as requiring non-invasive mechanical ventilation or higher on the WHO ordinal scale. And so what we saw was that there's a slight increase in odds ratio for adverse uh, events across many of the age groups, but really it's in the 18 to 49 year olds where we see an odds ratio of 2.58 for a severe death outcome in this baseline model. And then the next thing we did was add in blocks of variables. So we didn't do it all at once, but just took a block of, of each of them to, to look at specific factors that might be sex or gender mediated. So when we looked at admission source or BMI, obviously nursing home admission status was associated with mortality in our cohort. It did not modulate this baseline risk. Comorbid conditions, despite the imbalances, did not modulate the baseline risk. Smoking and alcohol use, again, more frequent in males, no modulation. Presenting vitals, so males did present slightly higher status at, at the original time, but that was also not modifying. And then general baseline labs, which includes albumin, kidney function, transaminases, things of that nature, none of that modified it. What did modify it was this baseline inflammatory lab profile that I was just showing you. So the IL-6 ferritin CRP sort of overall picture, if you add that in, you substantially alter the, the odds ratio for outcomes in males. And so what this suggested to us is that, you know, the, the broader data, not just from us, but from across is that there are persistent dis differences in disease severity in multiple studies across multiple environments. In our system, there was a higher risk of severe death outcomes in males, really in that younger age stratum where there's the highest risk, uh, highest exposure to sex hormones. The sex effect was modified by baseline inflammatory labs, but not by other variables that had differences by sex and gender. And so we took this to suggest that there were sex differences in the inflammatory response to SARS-CoV-2. And that was the driver of differences that we were observing in outcomes. So the open questions at this point were, is there a sex specific immune profile or is it just a gradation of response? So do you just turn up the volume on the response in males but it's otherwise identical or is it actually different mechanistic pathways? And then more to the point for the clinicians at the bedside is will immunomodulatory therapies perform in a similar way in males and females? And I asked this here just because, so looking at a couple of the immune therapeutics. So this is a supplemental table from the recovery trial that forms the basis for the use of dexamethasone. If you look at the female subgroup, which includes, you know, 800, uh, almost 900 individuals, there is no benefit in the female subgroup. The male benefit seems to strengthen a little bit. Tocilizumab, anti-IL-6 receptor, again, the same story, benefit in males as if anything slightly stronger when considered in an, in a, 
a subgroup analysis in the females clearly crosses the confidence interval. And again, for the Janus kinase inhibitor, uh, baricitinib in the combination trial with remdesivir also published in the New England Journal. So we have this consistent theme that these immunomodulatory agents are not showing a strong benefit in females. And I'm not here to suggest that we don't use them in females. I'm here to suggest that we have something to learn. And because I think overall the benefits were significant and, and in, in discussing this, I know for at least the dexamethasone trial, they didn't think there was enough heterogeneity in the results to support reporting that it was different. But when it emerges in multiple different settings, you just have to start to think about it, even when the numbers are adequate. So in some cases, this could just be because numbers are smaller in the females than the males, but in many of them, they, they seem to be adequate to report a similar effect size at the very latest, uh, least. So we decided to look at the global immune response profile to identify features associated with progression to severe disease within males and females. And so what we're doing here is trying to look at what the pathway to severity is and to decide whether or not that that's unique or just a, a volume issue um, in terms of differences. And the volume issue is important because if you look at baseline between males and females, you'll find a bunch of things that are slightly different, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a driver of, of pathogenesis to severe. So if I start with a higher IL-6 versus someone else, then the change may not have the same impact. So how did we do this? So this was a combination of the clinical character characterization protocol for severe infectious disease and uh, collaboration with the Department of Biostatistics. So the SEPSI and CADRE uh, programs. They SEPSI enrolled patients who are admitted to the Johns Hopkins hospitals and not all five, just Hopkins with SARS-CoV-2 infection. They have whole blood PBMC and plasma collection and cadre is a G detailed chart extraction that includes things like time of medication receipt, comorbid conditions, laboratory data, and some extraction of the charts. And so for this study, I excluded uh, HIV, hep C, autoimmune disease, and active malignancy to really focus on the inflammation attributable to the SARS-CoV-2 infection. And it was a really uh, fantastic effort by Guido Massachesi, who's now an, a rising third-year medical student at uh, University of Maryland, and Britt White, who's a rising third-year medical student at GW, Ziki Fu, who's about to start a PhD at Harvard, and Ken Zhu in the um, biostatistics department at Bloomberg. So our first cohort is 95 people admitted between April and July of 2020. They have a median age of 53. And what's depicted here is the frequency of sampling at the days from test positive. The colored line is the duration of hospitalization. The, the purple dot is the time of sampling to give you an idea. Cause I think a lot of the studies reported in COVID, you know, first day zero sampling could be day 10 of infection. So just getting an idea of what we're actually looking at here. The sample was a median of four days after test positive and a median of one day uh, from the timing of peak disease, either before or after. And then our second cohort was a dexamethasone cohort. So 59 people admitted between July of 2020 and January of 2021, median age of 56. Sample was one day earlier from test positive and one day from peak disease. And the median sample was done on the day of dexamethasone, although it was manually confirmed to have been at least four hours after for all of the, the participants that we included. So then we did whole blood transcriptomics, and this is just the, the 20,000 foot view of the 2000 most variable genes grouped by sex and severity, and then with BMI and age just depicted to show you some of the ranges there. And um, you can start to see patterns that emerge and that clearly definitely dexamethasone is impacting the overall patterns of, of what is observed between the two. So drilling down a little bit, so this is an upset plot. So it depicts the gene set size for differentially expressed genes. Um, in each of the groups. So the row here, this is the original full cohort, all 95, has 3,100 genes that are differentially expressed. And these are the genes that overlap as connected with the other groups in the cohort. So the males only, the females only. And then the thing that, that's most immediately striking is that 54% of these 3,100 genes were shared by the male only cohort and only about hundred were shared by the females. So a really different magnitude of transcriptional disruption associated with severe disease in males as compared to females. So when we look at which genes these are, so if we look at the ones that are conserved between all groups, so all three females only, males only, the overall group, we see hypoxia associated pathways, which is good because we defined disease disease severity, severity based on hypoxia, and then some MHC peptide presentation. But again, it's a very small set of genes that actually are regulated differentially by both. If we look at the male only cohort, we see like all the signatures that have been reported. So neutrophil activation, degranulation, lots of neutrophil granulation pathway signatures some rage receptor binding. A lot of the th features that have been associated with severe disease are, are easily replicated in this male only cohort. 
When we look at females only, we see a very different pattern. So ER stress and protein processing and the unfolded protein response. And this is somewhat interesting because uh, the it, unfolded protein response pathway is actually required for coronavirus replication of many different coronavirus strains and ORF8 of SARS-CoV-2 binds to multiple of the factors in this pathway. So it's hard to say at this point, but it, it could suggest that there's more of a link to actual amounts of SARS-CoV-2 activity in severe disease in females than is observed in males where the inflammatory signature sort of dominates what we observe. So the summary of this initial look is that we see changes in neutrophil granule expression and, and um, an increase in, in immature neutrophil signatures in males. And in females, we see this ER stress pathway and unfolded protein response associated with severe disease compared to the same sex individuals with mild disease. So what happens when we look at dexamethasone? So we see overall here on the, I have the original male, I have male original, male dexamethasone, female original, female dexamethasone. And the striking thing is that basically there's almost no gene expression differences once you add dexamethasone to males with severe disease compared to males with non-severe disease. All of the enrichment is lost. The females still have about the same set size. It's like slightly over hundred genes that are different with limited overlap with the genes that were differentially regulated to begin with. So again, a, a really different response when we look at females and males comparing within sex to the severity, the drivers of severity. So how does this fit into the COVID-19 literature? Like no one can claim to have read all of the COVID-19 literature, but looking at some of the different papers that have been published about this, there's a nature medicine paper that looked at a, a very small cohort, 14 patients in the ICU, six of whom received dexamethasone and eight of whom received non-dex treatments. And they saw sex specific responses to dexamethasone in terms of the per percentage of neutrophils in males versus females and differences in phenotype of interferon activity and immunosuppressive neutrophils. Developing neutrophils have been linked to COVID-19 and this is um, reported actually, oh, the picture is switched. Um, sorry about that. In a paper from Catherine Blish's group where they made a score of five genes and then looked at whether that gene could predict mortality in large data sets and saw that the frequency of those genes was actually associated with mortality. And then neutrophil subphenotypes have also been linked to severity. So what we did was took the, the Blish signature. So this is DEF A1B, DEF A3, LTF, DEF A1, and S100A8. I'm just saying that because they weren't actually on the slide where they were supposed to be. And looking at the enrichment of these gene sets and their performance for, we used it for severe disease, not just for death because death was too small. And it actually performs fairly well, even in the females where we didn't see a large increase in neutrophil signatures overall. If you look specifically for an emergency neutrophil myelopoiesis signature, you do see that that associates with severe outcomes. And what happens after dexamethasone? So the signature actually still performs in females with a nearly identical AUC of 0.72 as compared to 0.76 in the untreated group and just no longer works at all in males. So suggesting that there's a substantial disruption to the neutrophil mobilization response in males associated with dexamethasone that's not recapitulated with females. So despite a lack of global enrichment, a narrow signature does predict severe disease for both females and males. And after dex is treatment, this still performs in females and does not in males. So then the, the final question is, um, and how am I doing in time? Okay. Um, differences in whole blood expression profile driven by quantitative or qualitative differences. Is it just a numbers issue? So historically there have been old papers that have suggested that there are neutrophil differences quantitatively between males and females, even in the absence of COVID. And in our paper and in many other papers, uh, there's a consistent difference in neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio with more neutrophilic inflammation in males as compared to females. So we did Cybersort X to look at the difference between neutrophil proportion in our mild to moderate here, the pink is, or salmon color is neutrophils and it increases as a proportion in the severe and the lymphocyte proportion here, which these are the T cells, the green are the, uh, are the B cells also decreases proportionately. And when we break this down by sex, again, we see this slight step off in females, maybe a little bit less remarkable than in males where we see a slightly bigger step off. And we did also see a nice correlation between our cyber sort a uh, statistically significant correlation between our cyber sort and a clinical neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio from a contemporaneous CBC. And so what happens with dexamethasone? So after dexamethasone, our cyber sort uh, is actually essentially equal across. We no longer see this neutrophil enrichment, but when you uh, deconvolute by sex, 
it again, we see the same step off in females and in males, it's actually gone a little bit in the opposite direction. So again, suggesting that this therapeutic intervention has really sex specific uh, impacts. And again, we saw a reasonable correlation between our neutrophil percentage by CyberSortX and uh, the clinical neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. So from a quantitative perspective, the proportion of neutrophils suggests there are differences in neutrophil mobilization, and there are sex-specific responses to dexamethasone, which is consistent with that Nature Medicine paper with its N of six patients that showed a, a similar um, phenomenon. So what about qualitative differences? So in the non-COVID literature, there's been report of higher granule expression at baseline. And so I think that was one of the things that we were trying to control for. So if just male neutrophils are just more granule loaded, we're still looking for a change associated with disease severity. And so would have controlled for that based on our, our design. More mature and responsive neutrophils in females. Um, let's, no editorial comment on maturity levels. Um, <laughs> And higher capacity for netosis in neutrophils from females, higher type one interferon signature in female neutrophils and increased mitochondrial metabolism in male neutrophils, which can be modulated by estradiol exposure. So here looking at two gene modules that were differentially expressed between males and females, which are specific neutrophil subphenotypes and immature neutrophil in a GM77 and another neutrophil module. What I've colored in here are genes that were upregulated in our male only neutrophil gene signatures. So multiple of these gene signatures that have been reported in other contexts are again showing up in our COVID data, suggesting that these things, even though they are at baseline perhaps expressed higher, are expressed even more highly after the exposure to SARS-CoV-2 in males. So then we looked at subphenotypes. So this is a paper from uh, a group at MIT where they looked at, uh, I think it's 297 individuals with COVID infection. They did a neutrophil enrichment negative selection step because neutrophils don't really work for single cell sequencing that well. And then did a, a correction for the proportion of neutrophils in that neutrophil enriched population. And what they did then was a non-negative matrix factorialization to create subphenotypes of neutrophils that reliably correlate and then look at the enrichment of those across time in their cohort at, as stratified by disease severity. So basically, for example, here, this neutrophil subtype two doesn't really show much difference on day zero or seven, but is enriched in severe disease at day three. And, uh, and so on. So what we did was we, we took this data set, inferred sex based on the average expression of Y-encoded genes. It actually is a beautifully annotated data set, but did not include sex and went through them manually and there was no ambiguous assignment. So clearly there was either Y gene expression or not. And then use the same non-negative matrix factorialization, but stratified it by sex to see whether we would see a qualitative difference in what's happening in these neutrophil subphenotypes at different times. So here's like the day zero. And I put down here sort of what these different things mean. So pro-neutrophils and NF-kappa B dominated neutrophil signature, a PDL1 positive interferon gene stimulated phenotype and immature phenotype. These are these um, granulocytic myeloid derived suppressor cell phenotype that's been so popular in cancer and in COVID. And here ISG positive. And these are samples that were actually overall just low in neutrophils so when they did their uh, correction factor. And so what do we see when we, we stratify it by sex? So interestingly, this day three increase in the PDL1 positive ISG1 positive neutrophils is really statistically at least driven by females. So females are the ones who are upregulating this particular neutrophil phenotype. In both of them, we see the non-severe diseases associated with an ISG driven, so a, an early type one interferon response, which makes nice sense. Both of them have that as a protective sort of non-severe disease phenotype. And then this immature neutrophil phenotype is emerging in the males, but really is not observed in the females at day zero. And then at day three, we do the same analysis. Again, we see that there are some features which are shared here. This granulocytic uh, MDSC signature is shared for both. That's a, a powerful predictor. It was the most powerful predictor across um, in, in their paper. Although I, I would suggest that like they actually probably missed some other things because it, the, the actual disease progression appears to be different between males and females. So this one is your strongest predictor because it's sex um, uh, independent, it appears at least. Whereas the other ones, for example, this, like there are just not as many quantitatively neutrophils, but of those neutrophils that are there, there's more of these pro-neutrophils and more of these NF-kappa B neutrophils or a greater increase in those in the males. And then likewise at day seven, again, we see some of the differences here, again, mostly in the immature and um, like neutrophil emergency myelopoietic response. So to summarize, I think, you know, 
whoever encounters COVID, we see some differences in gene expression initially. Those are predominantly suggesting that there is a difference in neutrophil mobilization and subphenotypes in males as compared to females. Although if you look closely, you can still find some signatures of emergency myelopoiesis in females. But importantly, when you treat with dexamethasone, we see a dramatic overall normalization of that particular signature, which actually kind of persists in the females underneath the, the lack of a lot of other gene regulation. So some potential implications. So I think the progression to severe disease is not uniform. And therapeutic interventions can certainly be more finely tuned to modulate the dysfunctional elements of the immune response of the patient in front of you. And diverse representation and focused analysis is, is like the, like, you know, Thing we keep shouting about in terms of like, if we're going to move towards precision medicine in lots of things, especially in infectious disease, where now we're trying to modulate the immune system more and more, understanding the baseline immune status of the, the host is, is going to become more and more critical. Um, so just lots of people to thank, in particular Guido, who did tons and tons of work for this, and, and Britt White. Um, and then um, my fabulous peer mentor, Rachel, and um, all of you for having me here today, and then lots of other people who collaborated on this work. Wow, that was fantastic. Uh, so we'll now uh, open it up to questions and I may take prerogative and ask, I, I have two quick ones uh, and then we'll get to Rachel and I think others. Um, uh, the uh, first, uh, first one was um, the uh, differences in inflammation mm -hmm. um, uh, that you highlighted uh, with higher inflammation in men um, early. I wonder if any of the studies have taken into account antigen burden. So. Uh, vi either viral load or, or plasma um, uh, uh, antigen levels? So, so, Peter, that's a great question. And I think, so there's, I'm going to pull out two things there. One, like in, whenever I talk to Steve about male and female or sex differences, he's always like, okay, so females are more inflammatory and males are more, and, but there's different types of inflammation. So I think females have a higher type one interferon response, which may actually be quite useful in the early events after exposure to a, an infection and not as useful in a chronic infection where you never eliminate the stimulus. But this IL-6 dominated sort of phenotype of the hyperinflammatory syndrome associated with COVID, I don't think is one that I would say is associated with females. And in fact, we actually show pretty clearly as do many other people that it's it's not. So I think there's different inflammation. Um, and then I think to your second question about antigen load, we are currently testing all of these for an antigen by, on the Samoa platform, because I want to sort of get at that um, unfolded protein response pathway. It's very attractive that maybe there's just more coronavirus replication in those relative females to males, sorry, severe to mild females. That might not be true across if you compare females to males, but it might just be that the disease progression, the more severe disease is actually associated with more coronavirus activity within females. So that's pending. And, and I think it would be incredibly interesting in the paper from um, Angela Rogers and the Annals of Internal Medicine that looked at the N antigen as a predictor of severe disease, males had higher N antigen levels, but again, they have more severe disease. And, and what I'm more interested in is how you get to severe disease within a sex as opposed to across. Yeah, great, great. And then the, the other question I had related to the NK, uh, the um, neutrophil differences. Yeah. And, and um, at least in the context of HIV, um, women have a uh, higher kynurnine pathway mm -hmm. uh, activity, the IDO pathway, mm -hmm. which um, one of its immunologic effects is to suppress TH17 cells, which then attract neutrophils. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, so one might anticipate that, you know, an exaggerated IDO response in women might actually suppress uh, uh, the neutrophil response. And I wondered if anyone's looked at that pathway in these, in these settings. In so Akiko Iwasaki has a paper on, on the, and suggesting that sex differences in the kynurenine pathway may be linked to sex differences in outcomes. So you're exactly right that that is certainly a very plausible additional pathway to look at. And I think to be honest, like, I mean, me in particular, but understanding of neutrophil biology is kind of at baby stages and a lot of the work done in it is, I mean, these are extremely sensitive cells that need to be handled in a particular way. And so I think um, we are unable to go back to our own samples. Like we don't have viable neutrophil present preservation. So we can't actually test these things, which is why we use the LaSalle data set, which has the advantage of having 297 people. So hopefully there's some robustness to uh, variation. But I think in understanding how a specific inflammatory pathway will affect in neutrophil output, we, we still have a long way to go. Great, thanks. Uh, Rachel. Um, 
First of all, that was amazing, Eileen. Thank you so much. I mean, this this work is incredible and I think it's so important for all, all of us to consider and all of our biological studies. Um, I had a biological question and then a clinic, more clinical question. So the biological question is that it's interesting the differences in the neutrophil sort of function phenotypes at baseline between mm -hmm. sexes. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you think that those baseline differences are more of a contributor to these, you know, like post-infection, post-intervention type responses, or if you think it's more like sex hormone influences sort of at the time of um, kind of playing, playing a role sort of at the time of those interventions. Yeah. So I think this is a super important question, especially like as we do more work on looking at individual variability, because I think sometimes things are true, but not important, right? Like we may have just lower numbers of neutrophils, but in general, you give me staff, you give somebody else staff, we'll do the same, somebody, a different sex staff will do the same. And so I think that's why um, I'm not sure how much those baseline differences matter. I think they may yeah. matter in cases of uh, pathology like lupus, for example. So if you have a set point that's slightly higher, it may mean that an additional trigger is more likely to trigger an autoimmune related event. But whether or not they're the driver of an outcome in an infection, I think is really hard to determine. And so that's why we were focused mostly from a therapeutic perspective on like, what are the biggest changes? Because those would be predicted to be the ones to be the intervention points of between moderate and severe disease. And, and then you had I, a clinical question? Yeah, the clinical question is just, you know, thinking about the effect size and sort of the differences yeah. between the sexes and also like the implementation of yeah. kind of different therapeutic approaches. Do you, do you foresee um, kind of mm, ideally having different approaches to treating infectious diseases and kind of approaching things um, that are uh, dictated by sex, I guess? Yeah. So it's a great question. And I think I'm very hesitant to like, you know, I mean, to me, this data is kind of scary in terms of like giving females dexamethasone doesn't seem like that useful. Dexamethasone is also kind of fine. I mean, like in terms of the risks of the intervention. So I would not, based on like our N of one work, change clinical practice. And I, I mean, I think I would say that overall, our goal should be to move towards precision, right? And sex is one of the factors that will be, it will impact precision, but co-infections, HIV status, like all these other things. So like, I think this is part of the baby steps at the beginning of moving towards a model where a patient gets a treatment that's like way more likely to actually benefit them. And as opposed to like population-based RCTs where we are looking for the signals that rise above all the noise where we actually are, are being precise. So I would hope so. Do I think we're anywhere near there? No, um, but maybe I'm just pessimistic. Tim. I think awesome as usual. So phenomenal talk. Great to see you here in San Francisco. So welcome. Um, I, so I, this, this is fascinating, right? I mean, the fact that you're showing that there is a differential response to immunomodulatory therapies, whether it's IL-6, you know, things like carrying it on to kind of uh, long COVID, <laughs> kind of break the, what, what are your, I'm, I'm curious what you think about in terms of, of sex differences and how this might be driving some of the clinical observations, you know, you know, obviously a lot of our long COVID cohorts are convenience cohorts. So we take people who come in that are wanting to participate, things like that. And so it's difficult to look at actual sex differences when we're, uh, you know, bio, from a biological standpoint, when we're looking at, at differences, but certainly as Michael can, and others can tell you well, that, you know, in, in our cohorts, we see female sex being, you know, increased risk of odds of developing uh, long COVID symptoms or PASC. Uh, over time, it seems to be independent in, in certain models when adjusted for other comorbidity and things like that. And just wanted to, you mentioned about, you know, a, a potentially a stronger interferon, uh, type one interferon supports early is good, but if it's if it's late, then it, it could be bad. And maybe we're thinking in the chronic phase, like we do with HIV as well, that, that this could actually be, uh, although a beneficial in an acute setting and survival from acute infection could actually play into increased morbidity down the road. So just, just, just want to get a quick thought, yeah. uh, what you might be thinking on that front. Yeah. So, I mean, I am tremendously thankful to you and Michael Peluso and others for touching the third rail of long COVID. Um, and I think that, I, I think it's an example of a case where, you know, it may be that the immune disruptions that happen early are more disruptive to the homeostatic balance overall in one sex or gender versus the other. And that the impact of the early inflammatory events, regardless of the clinical severity of disease and or the other predisposing fact features towards vasomotor symptoms or postural hypertension or all of those other things that the disruption to that homeostasis is more profound. And I think that that is going to require really careful study with 
endpoints that are as validated as possible in order to allow you to find the true signal in the noise. I think there's also clearly gender effects of perception of symptoms. I, like I, you know, I don't think that women have more of the vapors, but, but I do think that, you know, there are a different threshold for reporting symptoms. And I don't know how to overlay that into the, these real clinical findings. So I think always biometric measurable differences are gonna be useful in terms of like clearly assigning that. I also think the other problem there is gonna be categorizing different types of disease, whether it's vasomotor disease, CNS disease, cognitive function, but there are really good scales for a lot of those things. And so you can objectively measure some of these things independent of report and of, of individual report. And I, I think that there's something to be, something really useful to be learned there that will actually change how we help patients instead of just telling them that they're crazy because they're clearly not, right? But that's what we say when we don't know what is wrong, right? So not super helpful, but good luck. <laughs> So um, there's a question online uh, from Alan Landay. Uh, he wonders whether the sex differences that you describe during acute infection might have some impact uh, on either subsequent vaccine response or hybrid immunity. So Alan, those are great questions. I think, you know, in um, some of the other work with Sepsi has looked at and with um, the long COVID outsmart cohort at, at Hopkins has looked at immunoglobulin responses, uh, antibody features over time and, and starting getting into this messy middle that, that Tim, Tim's also discussing where like, this is all super clean, like early, no vaccines, you know, everybody's naive. And what do we do when things get a little messier? I think there haven't been giant differences in antibody titer with the exception of an association of antibody titer that's higher in males and also higher in severe disease in some of the, the cohorts. So how that will intersect with you know, response to vaccination, classically women have had a higher response to vaccination with some of these mRNA-based platforms. You know, the responses are so high that it's hard to, to really differentiate whether there's a, a quantitative difference. And the rate of decline does not seem to be that different. Whether there's a difference in boosted an amnestic response or uh, T cell responses underneath those, I think is, is harder to say. And, and I don't actually have any of those answers, Alan. So um, if you do, please feel free to share. But I, I think in general, the severity of this illness should decrease. And in general, that is true. So I think at this point, it's much harder to, it would be much harder to look for a difference between severe and mild disease in a vaccinated population because severe disease is probably also going to be the result of other overlying or intersecting comorbidities. Yeah, I, I thanks, uh, Eileen. It's always great to hear. And as you know, we're working on the HIV side. And, and so I think it, the whole vaccine questions are, are re wonderful and things that I think we all should be collaborating and thinking about together. Uh, in terms of the outcomes, and especially with some of the newer uh, variants that we're dealing with. And I would also maybe ask, as you're looking at U.S. cohorts, is what about in outside of the U.S., as you talked about, in a global basis for sex differences, where you're looking at all the other underlying infections as a, as a corollary question? Right. And, and we, I specifically excluded HIV, hep C, autoimmunity, and malignancy in this look. And so again, it's like when people say something is sex or gender, like for example, alcohol use. So, but alcohol use affects magnitude of gene expression change differently between males and females. So it's a gender-based effect with a biological intersection of outcome. And so similarly, I think a lot of these things will have gender-based associations, but also intersect with biological impacts. Oh, outstanding discussion. So let's give a round of applause for Eileen. And for our CIFAR scholars who are here, you've just seen a great example of someone who's um, developed, you know, real leadership and sex differences in the HIV field, and then use that to pivot uh, to a completely different infection in a remarkable way. Uh, so, uh, so thank you, Eileen, uh, for being a great role model as well. Um, so um, we're going to pivot to the next uh, section, and I'm going to invite up uh, Lawrence Wang, uh, who's going to introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Peter, and uh, thank you, Rebecca and Eileen, for two very thought-provoking presentations. I was taking a lot of notes. So uh, it's my sincere pleasure to introduce Dr. Katerina Bianova, who is a, a third-year UCSF Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine Fellow. Uh, Katerina is um, 
working under my uh, mentorship, uh, as well as the co-mentorship of Peter, who was also modest to not take credit for co-mentoring Rebecca as well. Uh, but uh, Katerina, like Rebecca, has been one of the uh, drivers of our research program that's based in Kampala, Uganda. Um, and as a pulmonologist, she's not studying sex-based differences and the menopausal transition like Rebecca, but she's focused on pulmonary disease and the specific uh, pulmonary disease that she's looking at is a specific abnormality in lung function. It's called the diffusing capacity for carbon monoxide, which in the general population is not the most frequent abnormality seen, but in people with HIV it appears to be much more frequent. And so uh, she's leading probably the first study looking at diffusion abnormalities in sub-Saharan Africa. And she can answer questions about some of the challenges in doing a test that requires a pressurized gas of 0.3 carbon monoxide 10% helium, 20% oxygen, and a pressurized cylinder that you can't put on an airplane going from the United States to Sub-Saharan Africa. So you need to source it somewhere where it can get there by uh, land or sea. So Katerina. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, so now for a complete change of pace, I'm gonna be talking about diffusing capacity and a little bit more also about chronic lung disease in people with HIV in general. Uh, and because I'm sure that you don't spend all your time thinking about pulmonary function testing, I'm gonna start with a brief overview of pulmonary function testing, then describe several of the common patterns of chronic respiratory disease in people with HIV and then focus on this ISO-DLCO phenotype, which I'll define and describe for you. So briefly about pulmonary function testing, and this is the specific device that we're using. This is a portable device. It's not the usual kind of box that you may have seen walking into a pulmonary function lab. Um, but there's three major components. The one that is best study that we know the most of is spirometry, where we measure air that's exhaled, total air exhaled in a force maneuver versus in the amount that's exhaled in the first second. And this is really best for assessing airway disease. So things like COPD and asthma. It doesn't really give us a lot of information about other um, lung conditions. And just for definitions, abnormal spirometry can be defined as the ratio of FEV1 to FVC less than 0.7 or 70% or less than the lower limit of normal. And for the purposes of this talk, I'll use lower limit of normal. Diffusing capacity for carbon monoxide is a metric that helps understand gas transfer from air into the bloodstream. And it's a non-specific metric. It's associated with a number of conditions, could be associated with destruction of uh, the alveoli, like in emphysema, thickening of the interstitium, like in lung fibrosis, or impaired vascular flow with pulmonary hypertension, or sometimes with anemia as well, so having fewer red cells where the oxygen can bind to. Abnormal DLCO can be defined as um, less than the lower limit of normal, and in some older studies, less than 80% predicted. And then very briefly about total lung capacity, this is truly measuring static lung volumes, not just the air that you're able to exhale, but also what's left in the lungs after you, you fully empty your lungs. Um, and this is the gold standard for things like um, um, lung fibrosis, so interstitial lung diseases, as well as chest deformities, so consequences of scoliosis, um, and also neuromuscular weakness. And I will gloss over TLC today, and apologies for that. Um, I think talking to you guys, this is a very broad slide, but the main point I'm trying to uh, relay here is that people with HIV have a higher burden of pulmonary infections, lung cancer, and chronic lung disease. And, and that's even when they're well-controlled on ART. And there's a multitude of factors that are playing a role. So the main one is chronic inflammation and immune activation. HIV persists in the lung. There's um, differential expression of and activation of various immune pathways, but there's also the components of environmental triggers like air pollution and smoking, dysbiosis, microbiome alterations, including outside of the lung, additional co-infections like CMV, TB, hepatitis, and then factors related to aging. I think everybody here knows that COPD is more prevalent among people with HIV compared to the general population. That's the chronic lung condition that's best studied, and it's in part because it's very common in the general population, it's highly relevant, and we have something we can treat it with. Um, this is a systematic review and meta-analysis from 2018 that just goes to show that there, the odds of having COPD if you are HIV positive are higher 
than um, if you're HIV negative across all of these studies. The overall rate that they estimated of COPD was about 10.6%, but there is really wild variation between cohorts, again, depending on the nature of the cohort. The important thing here is that COPD in people with HIV is associated with a higher symptom burden, worse six minute walk test, increased frailty and worse quality of life compared to matched HIV negative counterparts. And there are no specific screening and treatment guidelines pertaining to people with HIV. But then again, people with HIV have a higher respiratory symptom burden even without COPD. So this leads me to talk about some of the other PFT abnormalities that we see in people with HIV. So we've talked about spirometric patterns. I'm briefly going to talk about this kind of newer idea of PRISM or preserved ratio impaired spirometry. So that means normal spirometry, but abnormal FEV1. And this is some work done by Dr. Abelman that I'd like to highlight, which I think is really exciting. And then I'll focus on the DLCO, DLCO abnormalities. I think it's important to keep in mind that that can occur in people with normal or abnormal spirometry. So you could have COPD and have abnormal DLCO, or you could just have abnormal DLCO. The phenotype that has normal spirometry, so no COPD, but abnormal DLCO is something that we have termed iso-DLCO, and this is how I refer to it uh, for the rest of the talk. And then TLC abnormalities are less well studied in people with HIV. Um, there's only a couple of studies which seem to show no difference in TLC after acute infection, so things like pneumonia or pneumocystis. And then there's some signal for higher TLC in people with HIV who smoke cannabis. That is a relatively unexplored area, and so this, these are very, very early findings. Um, just a quick detour to talk about PRISM. PRISM is this interesting concept that people are trying to wrap their head around because it's a dy dynamic evolving phenotype over time. So people can go from normal to PRISM to COPD back to normal. So there is some variation that's happening. And the reason it's important is because it's been consistently associated with wor worse respiratory, cardiovascular and mortality outcomes in the population. And female sex, extremes of BMI and smoking seem to be three of the most common risk factors. Among, P, uh, among people with HIV, there's really only two studies, one of which is Dr. Abelman's. And interestingly, there is a consistent trend where women with HIV have higher odds of PRISM than men. And in one study, that was a 22-fold odd risk difference or odds difference. And in another one, it was threefold. Um, but overall, the odds of PRISM in people with HIV taken together seem to be lower. And that's something that we're trying to figure out um, the reasons for. Now on to DLCO, which is really the topic of this conversation. So DLCO is the most common PFT abnormality among people with HIV, with or without abnormal spirometry. These are uh, the top rows are data from the Max and Weiss cohorts. And you can see that there's studies from 2013 and then there is kind of a newer <laughs> updated estimate essentially from 2020 and 2023. And you can see that the prevalence of DLCO impairment is consistently higher than that of abnormal spirometry. And this is really prevalent in the early days, but also consistent as we go, um, even in, in these more recent studies. And we have very preliminary data from Uganda, but we're seeing the same pattern where we're seeing about 14% uh, rate of obstruction and about 22% rate of DLCO, less than 80% predicted. And I would mention that the 22% in our cohort is also 22% of DLCO less than the lower limit of normal. Now, DLCO in general is associated with uh, greater symptom burden and worse outcomes. Um, that has been very well described in COPD. And among people uh, who smoke DLCO may be a phenotype of early emphysema. So you can have normal spirometry, but DLCO is a marker of early disease. Abnormal DLCO is also an independent predictor of all of these um, uh, symptoms um, uh, of worse respiratory symptoms and again, six minute walk test. And it's an independent predictor of mortality in people with HIV who have COPD. Now shifting gears to ISO DLCO. So again, this is normal spirometry with abnormal DLCO and that's the most prevalent pulmonary phenotype among people with HIV. In our own local cohort here from San Francisco and Seattle in this AMOLD study, we had looking at about 200 participants, we found that the um, DLCO, uh, ISO DLCO again, is the most common phenotype um, in our population outside of normal, of course, with 34.1% of our participants having this phenotype. 
In Uganda, that's a slightly lower prevalence. It's 9.4, uh, with some caveats in terms of different reference equations used as well and how the well they apply to Uganda, which is a separate discussion. And there are slight differences between people with HIV and HIV negative individuals, but this is again, very early data. And I briefly mentioned that in the general population, ISO-DLCO is really uncommon. It's being described as um, early marker of emphysema in smokers or vascular damage. It's been described as this result of pseudo normalization of spirometry. So if you have emphysema and fibrosis, they cancel each, out, each other out numbers wise. And so all you see is abnorm abnormal DLCO. And then um, it's been interestingly described after environmental uh, exposures in um, Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. Um, this is a very complicated slide, but the main point that I'm trying to confer here is that the inflammatory marker patterns associated with DLCO differ by spirometric outcomes. So if you look at the associations between these common inflammatory markers studied in HIV and DLCO percent predicted stratified by abnormal spirometry on the left and normal spirometry on the right, you'll see that the patterns are very different. And specifically, ISO-DLCO actually has its own um, unique inflammatory biomarker pattern, suggesting that there may be an underlying, underlying pathophysiology that's distinct to this phenotype. Interestingly, um, the odds of ISO-DLCO are increased with greater number of prior pneumonias. And this is work from um, one of the residents incoming fellows in our lab. And also interestingly, moderate to severe ISO-DLCO is associated with an increased uh, respiratory symptom burden. And here I'm using three different respiratory questionnaires. MMRC measures dyspnea, CAT is a composite of nine different respiratory symptoms is the COPD assessment test. And SGRQ is again, another composite questionnaire looking at um, various respiratory symptoms and quality of life. And this is the unadjusted analysis, but when you look at the multivariable analysis, um, you can see that these associations hold and specifically in this moderate to severe ISO-DLCO category. And looking at specific um, symptoms, again, it's the it's breathlessness, decreased activity, decreased confidence in leaving home and decreased energy that are most severely associated with this ISO-DLCO phenotype, which makes sense because if you have decreased gas transfer, breathlessness or dyspnea would be what you would expect as the primary finding clinically. Um, another, um, another interesting piece of data is that uh, moderate to severe ISO-DLCO, not just DLCO, is associated with increased mortality. On the panel on the left, so panel A, you're just looking at all DLCO and its association with mortality. And on, the, on panel B, you're only looking at people who have ISO-DLCO. And again, you can see that the moderate to severe phenotype is associated with mortality. And the trends are really very similar between the DLCO and the ISO-DLCO um, Kaplan microbes, kind of suggesting that it's the DLCO that's the driver here of mortality or one of the most important ones. And then there's some very interesting data, like all of this was cross-sectional analyses, but looking longitudinally, again, it seems like ISO-DLCO may also be one of these plastic phenotypes. So there is some reversibility um, when you follow it over time. And taking these, the two highlighted um, uh, groups here, the one, one that went from ISO-DLCO to normal and the one that stayed ISO-DLCO and looking at their respiratory symptoms, you can see that the respiratory symptoms change as the phenotype changes. So as you go to normal, your respiratory symptom scores go down, which is what you would expect. But if you stay ISO-DLCO, they stay the same or even go up over time. So the etiology of ISO-DLCO at this point is unknown. Um, and again, this could be a marker of early emphysema, like it's seen in smokers in the general population, could be early ILD, could be pulmonary hypertension, which is already more prevalent in people with HIV. Um, but given that unique inflammatory phenotype, I think it's worth considering that at least in a subset of people with HIV, ISO-DLCO is an HIV-specific pulmonary phenotype. The way to really understand this is to really correlate PFTs with chest CTs and echocardiography findings. And again, Cs, they're really evidence of early emphysema, early ILD. Um, collect longitudinal data and then try to think more about the different drivers of DLCO in different settings. We're only just starting to get data from Uganda, but assuming that it's the same risk factors there as it is here, is um, that could be additional to HIV um, would be a little bit naive. And so in conclusion, 
People with HIV have an increased burden of chronic lung disease, high rate of PFT abnormalities. COPD is best studied, but other phenotypes are important. Think about DLCO because it's associated with increased symptoms and mortality. And ISO-DLCO as an could be an HIV specific pulmonary phenotype. We have limited data from other lower resource settings, something we need to work on. And with that, I wanna thank my fabulous lab and everyone who's helped me along the way. Thank you. Really terrific, Katerina, thanks. <clears throat> we'll open it up uh, for questions. Um, uh, I may start with a question you, you uh, included in the list uh, earlier of um, uh, etiologies of low DLCO anemia. And I wondered, is, is hemoglobin used at all in the measurement uh, of uh, DLCO? So is that already accounted for, or is there a potential effect uh, beyond uh, what's already included in the measurement? We measure hemoglobin on the day of testing and we correct for it when we do our analyses, yeah, yes. Got it, got so it. That's, that's why it wasn't included as yeah. one of the possible ideologies. <laughs> got, it, got it, okay. <laughs> uh, open it up uh, for uh, other questions uh, from the group. Um, if, uh, in, uh, of the etiologies that you listed, uh, do you have a favorite? Uh, what do you think is, um, what does your instinct tell you as a pulmonologist? Um, My feeling is that with ISO DLCO, we're going to see a mixture of, of all of these things, but I do think there's going to be a subset that we're not going to be able to explain well, and I do think that that's going to be the one that's going to be most interesting. The question would be, how do we parse out these specific individuals in our future studies from people who may have, for example, early emphysema? And, you know, the data here is from San Francisco, where our smoking rate is sky high. So, you know, we would really have to exclude things like emphysema before we can really narrow down on this HIV-specific phenotype. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, Eileen. Uh, here, let me pass the microphone up. Do you think the HIV specific phenotype would have anything to do with viral suppression or do you think it's more of an immunologic set point that happens? Like, do you think it's directly related to virus activity or more related to an inflammatory consequence? Um, my sense is that it's more related to an inflammatory con consequence because we have participants who've been virally suppressed and who've been relatively well controlled for a long time and yet we're still seeing this phenotype. But I ask me again in a couple of years, maybe I'll have a better answer for you. Priscilla. Hi, uh, Katarina, that was an amazing talk. Thanks for that. I'm curious about um, like therapeutics. Have you looked at things like pulmonary rehab in this setting? Is anyone doing that in persons with HIV? That is a great question. And no, we haven't. And part of it is that pulmonary rehab does not really, um, you know, it, it covers conditions like COPD or, uh, or interstitial lung disease, but um, I have yet to see it approved for, for just a DLCO abnormality, for example. And um, so people with HIV would qualify for the standard reasons, but these specific patients would not qualify for PR. Okay, um, uh, we'll now uh, move on to the next uh, segment uh, and uh, Priscilla uh, Shu will be introducing our next speaker. Thank you. So um, thanks, Peter. I, I'm just uh, I'm thrilled to be here and I'm really honored to introduce Matt Durstenfeld. So I think in a lot of these meetings, I'm used to being the only cardiologist in the room. So I'm thrilled that I'm joined with my uh, colleague and, and mentee, Matt. So Matt was a UCSF cardiology fellow, and he joined our faculty as an assistant professor of medicine at San Francisco General two years ago as a uh, K-12 scholar. And he's just been amazing since then. I can't say enough great things about him. He's like, uh, he's done everything that I can imagine and more. So he's been our critical person in the UCSF recover studies, looking at um, cardiovascular complications of long COVID. He's also led amazing studies in HIV and cardiology, which he'll talk about today. I think what's been great is, you know, he has started a whole um, CPET, so cardiopulmonary exercise testing program in research here at San Francisco General, and also started some clinical trials looking at cardiac rehab in this setting. So uh, thank you, Matt. I'm just thrilled to work with you and excited to hear what you're going to say. Thanks, Priscilla, for that kind introduction. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about exercise limitations in HIV 
and specifically about chronotropic incompetence as an underrecognized contributor. Don't worry, I'll explain what that is. So um, I wouldn't be a cardiologist if I didn't mention uh, statins. So um, I just want to say things that we like to do as cardiologists and as uh, doctors or healthcare providers in general are really focused on improving how long people live or helping them improve their quality of life. And so um, with the recent reprieve study results, I just have to mention that people with HIV should probably be on statins, but that's not what I'm talking about today. Today, I'm talking about another favorite of cardiologists, which is exercise. So uh, why is this important? Well, poor fitness is associated with mortality, quality of life, and incident cardiovascular disease. And in this study um, that looked at uh, a large number of veterans, um, it found that based on baseline cardiorespiratory fitness, or the, how much somebody can exercise, um, is associated with someone's uh, mortality risk. Um, and so in the blue bars here, this is the reference, which is the lowest exercise capacity. And the more you can exercise, the less likely you are to die. Um, and exercise limitations are also associated with worse quality of life. And the second thing I that's really important is that this is actually something that's modifiable. So we often think of fitness as something as, oh, somebody's fit or not, but um, actually what matters probably even more than somebody's baseline fitness activity is how it changes. And there's a lot of factors that can influence this, but uh, the key is that it is modifiable. So how is this relevant to HIV? Well, exercise capacity is reduced among people with HIV. And this is a systematic review and meta-analysis from 2018 that found a really significant de decrease in exercise capacity among HIV across all of these studies. And um, uh, so what you can see here is that it, it comes out to 8.2 milliliters per kilogram per minute. What does that even mean? That's two METs. Um, that's uh, about the same exercise capacity loss you'd expect for 15 to 20 years older of age, um, or a really significant decrease in what activities somebody could do. And it's true at all ages too, even among adolescents. So the big question is why? Why is exercise capacity reduced in HIV? So to try to answer this question, we're gonna to turn to cardiopulmonary exercise testing, which I imagine most of you are not that familiar with and even many cardiologists are not, um, but our pulmonology colleagues certainly are very familiar with it. And so what it is, um, this is um, how we do it with a, a cycle ergometer, but it's a maximal effort stress test. So we try to see how much somebody can exercise while well, we monitor their symptoms, their blood pressure, their heart rate, their ECG. Uh, and most importantly, we're measuring their oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide production. And that allows us to measure an objective reproducible exercise capacity, which we express in terms of peak VO2 or VO2 max, um, if it meets the criteria for maximal exercise. And uh, if it's reduced, then we can categorize the pattern of findings based on, on what we see uh, as possibly cardiac, pulmonary, or peripheral, or et cetera. And so I'm going to uh, go back in time to this conceptual model for exercise developed by Dr. Wasserman decades ago. And uh, to just to note that, um, sorry, I'm trying to try to bring the mouse. So um, all of these things um, play a role in how much someone can exercise from the mitochondria to the muscles, to the heart, to the lungs. And this concept is really based on the FIC principle. Um, which is that the oxygen consumed has to be equal to the oxygen delivered times the oxygen extracted. And the oxygen delivered is related to the heart rate and the stroke volume. So um, just to go into which of these could be the problem in HIV, why people with HIV can't exercise, it really could be all of them, starting with the mitochondria. Um, there's mitochondrial differences among people with HIV, both with and without antiretroviral therapy. There's evidence of sarcopenia in people with HIV, um, particularly with long-standing stand disease and with earlier antiretroviral therapies. There's evidence of endothelial dys dysfunction, which could affect the peripheral circulation and oxygen extraction. There's evidence of higher levels of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, diastolic dysfunction, and what I'm going to talk about today, chronotropic incompetence. Um, there's evidence of pulmonary hypertension in the pulmonary circulation. And then what we just heard about from Dr. Bayanova in the lungs with potentially this isolated DLCO could be related to reduced exercise capacity as shown by the six minute walk data. So it really could be all of these things. Um, and how could HIV actually contribute to these? Well, there could be direct viral effects. Um, it could be related to exposure to antiretroviral therapy, especially older regimens. It could be related to immune activation and chronic inflammation or potentially related to comorbidities, including those like depression, substance use, and cardiopulmonary disease. 
So the one I'm going to focus on today is chronotropic incompetence, because um, I think this one's a really interesting and intriguing one. And so before I go further, I'm going to stop and explain what it is. Um, it's actually not that complicated. It's the inability to increase heart rate during exercise. So all of you experience when you go out and exercise, you, even if you're just climbing a flight of stairs, your heart rate goes up. Um, and that has to do with the decrease in parasympathetic tone and then ultimately the increase in sympathetic tone. And that's a normal response to exercise as shown here in the purple graph shown here. Um, so that's a normal response to exercise. But what happens if your heart rate doesn't increase? So that's what's shown here in the yellow, and this is from our long COVID data. Um, if your heart rate doesn't increase as much, remember the FIC principle is that it's, equal, it's multiplied by the heart rate. So if your heart rate only increases 50%, you're gonna have a decreased exercise capacity. Um, there's some compensation with uh, potentially longer filling time and increased stroke volume, but that's the basic idea. And the way that we measure this most commonly in research um, is by using the adjusted heart rate reserve, which is this equation, which is basically how much does your heart rate change with exercise divided by how much do we expect it to change with exercise? So your age predicted maximum heart rate minus your rest heart rate. So how did I get interested in this? Well, it started with long COVID. I'm working with Michael Peluso, um, Steve Deeks, and Priscilla. Um, I uh, led the CPEP program, as Priscilla mentioned, in, in trying to investigate why people have uh, decreased exercise capacity in long COVID. And we found something really interesting that was totally unexpected, which is that about 30% of the participants had chronotropic incompetence, which is much higher than we experienced when we're reading stress tests in the exercise lab. And, uh, and so as we investigated this more, um, and as now published uh, in JID uh, recently, um, it, we found some really interesting things. Not surprisingly, we found the kind of common cardiometabolic risk factors, but we also find, found that everybody with chronotropic incompetence had evidence of early EBV reactivation after SARS-CoV-2 infection, and a high proportion of them had HIV. And um, so that's uh, really interesting, and it, it has potentially to do with inflammation and with dysregulated responses to autonomic signaling, probably not due to actual problems in the autonomic nervous system itself. And so that led to this next uh, idea of what about, well, we noticed that it's, it's more abnormal in people with uh, HIV in our long COVID cohort. Um, when we looked at the literature, there's really was only one published paper um, from about 10 years ago that was doing exercise treadmill testing in people with HIV um, to look at uh, risk factors for cardiopulmonary disease. And the thing that really stood out in that paper was that 31% of people with HIV had chronotropic incompetence. And that was kind of the dead end of that story. Nobody's investigated that since then, um, even though it's common. And so we uh, reproduced this we, um, uh, with a CIFAR uh, mentored scientist uh, grant. Um, we did cardiopulmonary testing, exercise testing in about 40 people with HIV, um, including people who've never had SARS-CoV-2, people with SARS-CoV-2 without long COVID and people with long COVID um, to try to see if that was a major factor in, in determining someone with HIV's exercise capacity. And what we found was that 38% of people in, in our cohort where we really did, a, 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 we tried to exclude people with cardiopulmonary disease had chronotropic incompetence versus only 11% of HIV negative, all of whom had long COVID. Um, and then we validated this externally um, with uh, Christine Erlinson at the University of Colorado and found that 29% of people with HIV in the exercise for healthy aging study had chronotropic incompetence versus about 10% of people without HIV. And that's a cohort of, uh, uh, 50 to 70 year olds um, who are all sedentary, similar BMIs, um, and and so really validated that chronotropic incompetence is more common among people with HIV. And the difference in adjusted heart rate reserve is really dramatic. So I uh, remember 80% and higher is kind of considered normal, but really around 100% is normal. So in our uh, our HIV uninfected um, individuals, um, the adjusted heart rate reserve was 99% exactly as predicted, but in HIV individuals with and without chronotropic incompetence, it was 80%. So really dramatically reduced. So the question is why? What are the risk factors for chronotropic incompetence? And I'm here to tell you that they're still unknown and hopefully we'll have some answers for you in a couple of years. In the general population, we know that diabetes, obesity, dyslipidemia, and smoking are associated with chronotropic incompetence. In long COVID, as I mentioned, those same cardiometabolic risk factors, as well as higher inflammatory markers, including high sensitivity CRP and IL-6. And we're really excited to look at that. We just got some uh, data back um, on our biomarker data in the HIV cohort. So it may be that we find that is true in HIV as well. 
And then uh, I mentioned EBV, EBV reactivation as well, maybe interesting in the long COVID cohort specifically. But among those with HIV, we really don't know. And this, this the paper I mentioned from 10 years ago from De Lorenzo et al., uh, really did not find significant differences based on NADER CD4 count, um, duration of time with HIV, HIV or exposure to protease inhibitors. And here we haven't really found anything yet so far and just our very crude look using uh, time since HIV diagnosis, current CD4, CD4 NADER or CD4, CD8 ratio. So the questions are, that are important are, is this a marker of risk or is this actually a cause of cardiovascular disease? And we don't know the answer to that. And it is an important question. And it is associated with things like atherosclerosis and diastolic dysfunction. And there may be a connection with increased interstitial fibrosis that's specific to HIV. Um, but one way that it could cause cardiovascular disease is due to this idea of beta receptor responsiveness. So when the heart rate doesn't increase as much when you exercise, then the body's response is to crank up the adrenergic response. And it seems that it does that chronically and not just during exercise. And that could uh, activate inflammatory and hypercoagulable pathways that could lead to cardiovascular events. So our big questions are what are HIV specific and cardiometabolic risk factors associated with chronotropic incompetence in HIV? What are the clinical implications, specifically associations with cardiovascular disease? And is chronotropic incompetence a modifiable risk factor for cardiovascular disease in HIV? And if so, how does it contribute to cardiovascular disease? And is exercise a potential treatment? And our preliminary data from the Exercise with Healthy Aging study, which we just submitted the abstract for, suggests that exercise may be helpful. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to present those results to you soon. So how can you help? Um, the two ways are, we're still trying to investigate this, so we need participants. And so uh, the two ways we're trying to investigate this, the first is um, by leveraging um, Priscilla's uh, Clear HIV study. And uh, this is a study of bempedoic acid versus placebo that's doing some really cool things scientifically um, to look at uh, FDG PET for uh, inflammation and atherosclerosis. And, um, and we're adding on a CPET study um, to look at, uh, uh, um, at chronotropic incompetence specifically, and we'll be able to correlate it with all of the measures from this uh, clinical trial. And then the second is we're investigating the um, effective exercise in uh, chronotropic incompetence in, in long COVID, which we think may have some similar mechanisms, particularly related to IL-6. Um, and so uh, please feel free to reach out to me if you have participants with long COVID, um, especially if they tell you on their Apple Watch their heart rate doesn't go up when they exercise. Uh, so I wanna thank all my mentors and collaborators. And as I mentioned, this is a, an exciting uh, new story that we don't have all the answers for, but we hope to come back soon and, and share some uh, exciting findings. That was, that was really terrific, uh, Matt. Um, uh, Rebecca, you have a question. Thanks, Matt, for a great talk. I know that you're actively studying all of this, but and that there's been a lot of interesting evidence about long COVID and EBV co-infection. Do you have any hypothesis in terms of the mechanism of EBV and some of this chron chronotopic incompetence? That's yeah, I, I think um, when I think about chronotropic incompetence, um, I think about like, where could the, the lesion be um, in like, as a neurologist might um, try to localize the lesion and uh, it could be something to do with the brain. Um, it could be to do with the autonomic nervous system that clearly controls heart rate uh, regulation. Um, and, uh, and it could be something in the heart itself. And in our long COVID data, we don't really find any evidence that there's any differences in um, in, in somebody having uh, problems with their conduction system or their sinus node um, directly. Um, we also don't find evidence of inflammation in the heart itself. Um, and, uh, but what we do find is markers of systemic inflammation. So things like CRP and IL-6, and that fits nicely with HIV, um, where we know that those markers are, are elevated and um, exactly how uh, those chronic uh, immune activation and leading to chronic inflammation um, causes uh, chronotropic incompetence. I think it might have something to do with the beta receptor density and responsiveness. Um, but, and so I think that the way EBV fits in is really by um, boosting up that in inflammatory response early on. I've got two questions, yeah. one a, a clinical one and then uh, one a bi biologic one. So the clinical one is, um, do you know if um, uh, folks with chronotropic incompetence um, have impaired orthostatic responses and they stand up, does their heart rate go up? That is an outstanding question. And we have, uh, we're almost done with our tilt table testing, which is the way that cardiologists formally answer that question. 
And uh, we do not see any difference in response to heart rate um, or blood pressure response to gravitational stress with the tilt table test. So we don't think that it has that chronotropic incompetence during an exercise test is really related to orthostatic um, stress. So, so they do respond normally. They respond normally. Yes. Okay. Now, and that's not specifically looking at people with HIV. That's looking at people with long COVID. Okay. Got it. And then the other, the other uh, question relates to, um, uh, well, it's a, maybe a comment uh, related to the EBV and the HIV uh, being both being risk factors uh, for um, uh, for chronotropic in, incompetence. So, uh, as you know, EBV has recently been linked to the pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, an autoantibody uh, phenomenon against you know you know neuronal um, uh, antigens or myelin sheaths or what have you, um, and um, uh, HIV, um, when it reactivates, it reactivates preferentially in the same anatomic spaces where EBV tends to reactivate, which is in the B cell follicles mm -hmm. of lymphoid tissues. That happens to be the same place where antibody responses develop. And, um, I've been wondering for a while, whether the, um, uh, many of the long COVID syndromes that we see may be related to autoantibodies uh, that form um, and everyone has their own specific autoantibody that they form against their own particular protein but many of them may be you know uh, related to neurons um, uh, but that it's the inflammatory it's inflammation at the site where um, antibodies uh, develop which may lower the threshold for autoantibodies in the same way that it it links to MS and, and, and HIV may either be directly doing this by reactivating the same place just as EBV is, or it could be in, um, uh, in you know, in, uh, in, in um, it could be inducing um, uh, uh, EBV reactivation um, uh, directly um, uh, in the same space and, and EBV could be, you know, doing these effects. So any thoughts on that? Um. I have a lot of thoughts and no conclusive answers. Um, I think uh, it, it, they probably are related. And it, one of the things that's hard to tease out in our small long COVID study is, um, like I said, everybody with chronotropic incompetence had evidence of EBV reactivation, both with and without HIV who had chronotropic incompetence. And it's kind of hard statistically to figure something out when it's everybody um, and a small number of people to begin with. So I think this is really hypothesis generating. and. I think um, further research is certainly needed. I will say that in terms of the autoantibodies, we have not seen a, a, a detectable signature of autoantibodies within the long COVID cohort, which makes me think that it may be less of a factor um, and it hasn't been investigated in, in HIV specific to chronotropic incompetence. Yeah, and, and it may not be molecular mimicry in that everyone has the same autoantibody. It could be that people have different autoantibodies, um, which may make, it, may make it more difficult to, to identify. And then one, uh, maybe one last question. Um, um, so uh, did, have you looked at CMV serostatus status uh, as, a, as a, is it related to chronotropic incompetence at all? Uh, not, not in our long COVID cohort. Okay. Um, we haven't looked at that in our HIV cohort. So we can, we can do that for you. Um, that and my bet is that it decreases it as it does with neurologic, uh, long COVID. And I, as I learned just last week, it also decreases MS risk. All right. So, Great, um, thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Uh, so that concludes our programming for the day. Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, for those of you staying for, there's a lunch um, uh, at noon uh, in the Building 100 courtyard upstairs, upstairs in the fifth floor conference room. Uh, so uh, you're welcome to join us. Uh, and uh, thank you for joining. And uh, congratulations again to all of our great speakers today. Thank you.